I highly a constant suggest empirical learner. Yes. I Welcome, actually Sydney. like that part of my resume more than I like the <laughs> artillery instructor part, but that's okay. Well, I'm glad um, I mentioned it. Yes, that's fine. Right. If you ever want to understand what, why I say I'm a disagreeable giver, you have to work with me a little bit. Uh, <laughs> but you should also read Adam Grant. Uh, he's hmm. a professor at Wharton. He teaches management. He has a book called Give and Take. Uh, highly recommended. I have no, I get no money from buying the book, so you, there's no like, no problem whatsoever. But I highly recommend that you learn what a disagreeable giver is, um, and an empirical learner. I'm going to assume everyone knows, so that I'm not going to explain. So um, the name is kind of an odd Israeli name, so I'm going to I'm going to correct you. I apologize in front of everyone. Uh, it's Sivan, and it's a Hebrew name. Uh, it's a Hebrew month, so hence the name. My mom did not punish me when I was born. Um, it's very common in Israel, so you know, if you ever step in Israel, Sivan is a good name. Um, and I'm a director of data science in a company called the Climate Corporation, which is kind of a different, um, different application of data science, uh, and it's in agriculture. Um, and so the picture actually depicts what we are, what kind of data we look at. And I'll, I'll try to convince you that it's an interesting domain. Um, I gave a talk four years ago in Berkeley and it was called, um, it was in front of the statistics department, and it was called Going Back to Our Roots. And the idea was that uh, statistics kind of started in agriculture. Um, so if you kind of know Fisher and experimental design. Um, and when I joined Climate, they hooked me up by telling me that agriculture is no longer what statistics thinks it is. And I got very intrigued. And so let me convince you that this is an interesting domain, and it's an interesting uh, data problem, and it's an interesting scientific problem. So farmers face a lot of challenges uh, these days, not just in the US, generally in the world. Uh, there's a rising population. If you do a, uh, read any projection, we're in 2050 going to be a very large population in the world. Uh, we have. A lot more people, the percentage of people who are eating uh, animal proteins is growing, so a lot more people are eating meat. Um, we have a growing uh, middle class, so that's another problem. And if you calculate how many uh, acres per person we have, it's, it's declining, it's decreasing over time. The other challenge that's not mentioned here is, um, and it's actually related to the name of the company, is climate change. And so the other part of the system is not just we have more demand, the supply is getting harder. Uh, there, it's harder to maintain yields, it's harder to grow uh, certain crops because of variability of weather. And so um, Climate, or the Climate Corporation, has started thinking about these problems many years ago, uh, 10, 10 years ago. Um, and we really want to make a big difference. Um, so our vision is to digitize the world of every farmer and help them actually execute their uh, operation flawlessly through data and data decision. It's a big vision. It's going to take us some time to get there. Um, the mission is, is really to help them kind of be more sustainable and produce things in a sustainable manner because uh, there are often years where they can produce a lot, but there are also years where they produce very little. So 2012 in the U.S. was a big drought year. If you've ever worked with agriculture data, you, you see kind of the yield going down that year. Prices went shoot it up because of it. Um, and it was a difficult year for growers. They, they really did not, um, there were not, a lot of growers had to go out of business that year. So the weather really dictates a lot for them. There's a very high risk in their uh, occupation. Um, so just to give you a sense of how they work, right? They have 40 fields. Our typical grower here in the US have 40 fields. And they span across 40 miles. So that's, if you're living in wonderful Berkeley, um, in that center, that's about 40 miles, according to Google. Um, that's a very large area. And if you think that they could, think that they have to manage that, that kind of uh, span, that's a very challenging problem. Uh, farm sizes range from 800 to 1,000 acres, but we also have 10,000 acres growers in our systems. So we are talking about massive operation to manage. Um, and it's family owned usually, so it's kind of your, your brother, your sister, your uncle, your, your children are all in this business. Um, so it's very much their livelihood depends on this kind of um, control and understanding. Um, a typical grower makes 40 decisions once a year and goes through 40 years of decisions. So that's a typical lifespan of a grower. Decisions range from uh, really throughout the season and it starts from 
around now, they start planning what to plant this year. They look at the selection from last year. Um, they look at how their decisions from last year affected, and they make decisions for the next year, prepping for the next year. Um, in March and April, they make fertility decisions, they make water decisions, and then they start the planting season. Um, there's a lot of logistics involved, how to plant, when to plant, where to plant. Uh, during the season itself, there are fertility management decisions that they can make. There's some water management that they can make. They do a lot of scouting. They try to understand how the crop is evolving. Um, and then they, they make decisions related to harvest when the harvest season start, stops. And then, so now they're harvesting, but at the same time, they're really going back to plan, planning the next year. Where climate comes in is we really are trying to help them make their decision in a better way. We're focusing on their seeding and planting decisions, their fertility decision, helping them with field insights, which is kind of targeting their most vulnerable, vulnerable areas. Um, we, are, we have capabilities both in data science as software engineers, like everyone said here, getting the data is a very challenging uh, part of the business. And I think that's where kind of um, you see the last layer is where climate has been investing a lot of time in. So we have data from weather, to remote sensing, to field data, to germplasm, so genetics is involved, and grower data. And in some aspects, we talked a little bit about this, it's very similar to healthcare in a little bit, if you think about it. We're trying to help growers make their decisions in a personalized w uh, manner, right? To actually make their decision in their field. And in, um, in the world of healthcare, right now is moving in that direction, right? To help you make a decision about which treatment to get, uh, which drug to take, and it's taking a similar view where they're looking at a system problem, right? You have the genetics, you have the environment, you're trying to see how it interacts with each other, with the person. It's very similar to kind of the approach we're taking and we're trying to understand. And it's very complex, just like uh, healthcare, um, you know, getting uh, personalized medicine for you is hard. It's a very similar issue in uh, agriculture to get that kind of um, personalized attention. Um, so how do we still tackle it, right? Um, so in climate, we kind of look at data science as a three-way problem. So first, you really do need the data. And we have data from um, experiments. But I will challenge everyone here to think that if you think that um, you think of worlds like marketing and uh, the Google advertising and things like that, where experiments can be run really often and you get feedback really often. Uh, in agriculture, that's not the case. Uh, you can't run experiment really often. You put it in the field and it, it takes a season. And a season is a year. And hence, um, no matter how much you water it and fertilize it, it's just not going to grow that fast. And so you, you have to have a year. Uh, and so experiments are very cost intensive in agriculture and um, very time consuming. And so that is probably not the biggest, the best way to get big data, right? So you've got data from experiments, but it's usually not huge. Um, the other way to get data is from either um, actual growers, right? So we do have thousands of growers. They grow on thousands of acres. So you do the math, you get a lot of, a lot of data. And um, some of it, that's kind of the strategy that climate has been taking, which is helping growers get into a platform that really does get them a, a sense of, um, understanding the data better, understanding the insights into the data better, and learning from each other. Um, so get the data, get the domain science, and this is kind of an aspect we didn't really talk about a lot in other talks, but uh, we really do need the domain experts in the agriculture business to understand things and to uh, bring together statistician machine learners with domain experts because ultimately we work with weather, we work with agriculture, with his soil, we work with um, we work with plant scientists. We have actually hired all these people into climate because we got the understanding that we cannot build black boxes. Our clients will not trust us if we build complete black boxes. This is uh, less of an issue, I think, for, um, like, if you Google search, you don't really care. Google just invented a new algorithm. It's uh, deep learning. It's the new search engine. You're like, great. It, I'm going to get my results better. That's awesome. Um, growers are not going to respond that nicely to it, right? That's their livelihood. So they are not going to trust you just because you built an awesome machine learning, deep learning, shallow learning, wide learning <laughs> algorithm. They're just not going to trust you because you say it's working. Um, 
there's back testing. There are other right ways of doing this, but um, the proof is in the pudding, and the way to prove it is to wait a year, and so or maybe or maybe several years. And so it's not it's a it's a hard problem. And one of the ways we've tackled it is to bring the domain scientists internally and to try to build models which have some explanatory uh, value in them. Um, and then the last piece, obviously, is the data scientist. Um, and we, we basically have our teams built this way. We have domain scientists and data scientists and engineers all sitting in, a, in one team. Um, this is my mantra. I hope it's mantras for many people in the room. But we often say, you know, all models are wrong, <laughs> right? Some are just pra a little bit more practical than others, so we should use those. And I think we lead with that kind of mantra in the company, where we believe that we need to build models, but we need to also understand their vulnerability and understand when they're going to work and when they're not going to work so well, and learn how to protect from that kind of problem. Um, we have a lot of data. So we build models. We've got a lot of data, just to give you some sense. Uh, we've got seed genetics, so phenotype, genotype kind of information on different seeds. Um, we monitor, we have our own monitoring systems, but we also tap to a lot of, of publicly available environmental <coughs> conditions uh, data. And then um, you look at this tractor, you know how many sensors are on this tractor? There are hundreds of sensors on one, one harvester, single harvester. Uh, the amount of data today that um, are being collected from harvesters and planters is insanely rich. And um, if uh, I think if Fisher had to redo his experiments on this kind of data, it, it would not work. Two factorials, all these things would not work. They all failed miserably. And so um, it's really rich, rich data sets that these sensors are collecting today. In real time, you can see how uh, people are planting, what they're planting, how much they're planting, how much space there are between seeds. Like it's that amount, and each of these um, are mounted on each of these rows. And so it really is rich data sets. And then we've got in-ground sensors, obviously, for soil moisture, for example, for nitrate, for other kind of fertility information. So it's a f we are taking really a system approach from all sides of the data. But as we all know, data is never beautiful and clean and wonderful. So I think my boss says it really well, and he says, uh, you can trust the data, but you must verify the data all the time. So I think that's right. I've always been promised the ultimate data set and never have seen it yet. <laughs> um, so, you know, any data that I've ever been given and any, any time that I've ever had to analyze data, I start by asking lots of questions and it usually is a very good um, advice. Um, we take a very multifaceted approach to our um, developing our models, as I said. Um, we are, we're kind of like a little academia inside the company, our data science organization. We have a real research review kind of iterative model. It's very agile and collaborative. Uh, we run experiments, but the experiments, as I said, are year-long experiments, and hence they generate some data, but not enough data to sort of um, scale models and things like that. And so the other facet of information comes from observational studies and causal inference, which I'm going to, in vote of hands, how many people have heard of causal inference? Perfect. Ship it. Okay, observational <laughs> studies. We're done. Excellent. I do not need to talk about it. Okay. Um, but we do actually understand, right, we have expert in causal inference who are trying to understand um, why things uh, occur in the way they do so that we can explain to growers um, the causal mechanisms of these things. Um, scientific challenges range from a lot of things. So the data, it's spatial temporal in nature. Um, so. Uh, I, I should have shown you a picture of where we have data, but it's across the US. We have also in Brazil, we've got Canada, we've got even Europe in some of our data. So it's very diverse. Uh, uh, it's horribly heterogeneous. So temporally, sometimes we have every minute, sometimes we have every hour, and sometimes we have every day and every week and once a month. And so um, it's really not beautiful in that sense. Um, spatially, it's the same. There's county level data, there's um, country level data, but there's also, like I said, the sensors are producing data at a very fine resolution. So there's a lot of missing data. Um, it's observational study, so you know that um, yeah, you cannot make lots of assumptions that you're controlling like an experiment, and so that comes with its own biases and problems. Um, learning features is hard. 
there's a lot of multitask learning that we need to do. Uh, there's a lot of latent features that we need to uncover. Uh, for example, it just like think about the simplest problem. We want to we want to model yield, end of the season yield, and uh, everyone says the weather affects it. Okay, how? How would you? What's the features that you should put in to model yield? I challenge anyone in the room to try this. Um, I think it's a really interesting problem. I've been working on it for five years now. So um, I think it's a challenging problem, um, knowing which features should go in. Um, some models are now tackling it by trying to do it automatically, obviously. Uh, but I would tell you that a grower won't like the idea that, oh, well, you, this, 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 just look at this architecture, this node, is, this is where the weather comes in. That's not going to work. So you have to be able to explain why, why precipitation at the second, second week after planting is the important variable. And so um, these are the kind of challenges we have. Um, I want to give you some real examples of, the pro of what we're doing. So this is kind of a screenshot of one of our tools. It's a planting management tool. What it does, it's um, a grower can, can come into the system and um, select the field and um, tell us, for example, which uh, hybrid they want, what their target yield is, what they want to grow. Um, how, and, and we can recommend to them uh, the type of, the population is the number of seed per, per acre. Um, what we do is we uh, help them figure out their planting management zones, it's called. So you see kind of different colors represent different zones. And in different zones, you do different practices. So for example, you may plant uh, more, more seeds on the red one, you may plant less seeds on the yellow one or the green weird one um, because, well, that's higher risk or lower risk. And so we model these kind of risks and as a result of it, we change our recommendation to the grower. Um, so one of the aspects of our, um, of our data scientists is to try to produce these kind of management zones. So what you see at the top are yield monitor data. So it's, as I said, the sensors produce a lot of data. Uh, it's normalized, so red CS says you know, it's low yield, and green, very green, is uh, high, high yield. And what you can see at the, the bottom is kind of the, um, the zones on top of it. Um, and you can see some zones, you know, they change between uh, this is one year, this is one year, this is one year, I should have said. These are three different years. And you can see it kind of, sometimes the same zone flips from being the worst area of the field to the best area of the field. And sometimes you have zones that are always bad, right? So you could start think, think about this problem that you're helping growers make decisions at the sub-field level on how to plant, right? Because if it, an area is always bad, they shouldn't be planting that much there. Maybe there is like, for example, um, this area is lower in the field, and so it gets some water problem over there, and so maybe they shouldn't be planting that much over there. So you want to really help them make these kind of decisions. Um, another problem, which I think is kind of a cute, hard problem. Um, on the left, you're seeing um, hybrids, corn hybrids, for, for exact. Um, so you see hybrid A, hybrid B, hybrid C, hybrid D. The different curves represent different years, and this is one location. Right, so you can see um, people tend to think about, um, people, when I say people, um, agronomists usually tend to think that there's, if you plot seeding rate versus yield, you will get a very nice curve and you can find an optimal, beautiful like seeding rate that you should be planting in. Um, and what happens to be the case is this is one location and four different hybrids in two different years and you can see that that one point is not that easy to find. Uh, it changes as a factor of year, it changes as a factor of the hybrid. Um, the other side of the story is, okay, take the single hybrid, grow it in multiple locations, and ask the same question, and again, you get to see that finding that wonderful optimal point is not that easy, because multiple locations have different environments, and the environment affects how the hybrid uh, interacts. And so, um, building a recommendation system, think of what we're trying to do, build a recommendation system, that can recommend the best hybrid for a given location in a given year. Oh, and by the way, do it before the year starts. So you don't know the weather. This is after the weather, I can find that inflection point. But before the weather starts, you also have to predict that uncertainty of the weather. And so the diff the, it becomes a very difficult problem. Um, another, another system we have is kind of helping them monitor their crop health. So what you see here are, uh, are based on satellite imagery at a five meter resolution. Um, again, on the, on the left side you see um, 
uh, kind of um, is correlated with their biomass, right? It's, an, it's a vegetative index from a satellite, and it's a, you can see over time, what you see at the bottom is kind of the map over time, and it helps the grower understand how the crop is evolving over time. The scouting map is helping them decide where they should scout. Again, 40, 40 fields across you know, a very large geography. So telling them where they should scout, look for problems, is a, actually a very, um, a very helpful tool. Um, and so you can see the red areas are something that they should scout. Um, to give you an example of a problem, um, you can see um, kind of three images uh, for a given field. It's a circle because it's an irrigation system. So it's a circle. So if, from now on, when you fly on across the U.S., just look down. You'll see a lot of circles. Those circles are irrigation. I forever am um, never going to be able to get that out of my mind now that I fly. So it's a really nice to look at it. Uh, but you see, at the beginning of June 11th, they kind of started having issues uh, in the middle. Uh, on June 14th, you see, you kind of start to see real the circles. And in August 15th, you see there was a problem in the actual um, irrigation system. It was clogged in the middle, and hence the, the problem that you're seeing at the left. The other problem that you're seeing is the cloud, which is, oh, clouds are exactly the same as problems on the fields. <laughs> hence, you first need to actually figure out how to differentiate the clouds from the other things, mm -hmm. which is... Um, this is another problem we have to tackle, which is um, if you look at this, um, this is a map from the top, right? It's a satellite view of false color. This is a cloud. This is the shadow of the cloud. So the, the green thing is a shadow of a cloud. Um, and this is manually labeling, actually, like what is a cloud, what is a shadow, and things like that. And then we had to develop our own algorithm, which is hopefully agnostic to the type of satellite. That's another problem. Each satellite company has its own little shtick in this world. However, they're not very collaborative in nature. And hence, you have to figure out how to make them work together. Um, so that's another challenge. The last challenge in this kind of uh, thing is satellite, satellite is awesome, but satellite is uh, a problem because you've got some satellites that roam the world every day. They're usually very coarse in their spatial resolution. Um, so those are the top. You can literally see blocks, right? Um, then you have satellites that are roam the world a little less frequently, but their spatial resolution is much finer. But what you want is to show an image to a grower every week or every two days, every time it can make a decision. So you really want to combine them somehow together. And so that's called fusion, uh, sensor fusion, and it's a field. Actually, a lot of people in Berkeley have been talking to us about it, so it's an active field of research, which we are also engaged in. Um, the last topic is fertility management, and it's a huge input cost for growers. Um, this is kind of a screenshot of one of our uh, fertility management tool. Um, nitrogen and in general fertility is a very uh, hard thing to model. There's a lot of processes that go into this um, life cycle of how the plant takes up um, nutrients and how they go into the atmosphere. Um, and so to give you kind of an example, we have our own proprietary models that help us kind of figure out how the plants are interacting with the, with fertil with the fertility management. Um, last year, 2015 in December, it was an extremely wet and warm uh, December. So wet on the left, warm on the right. These kind of conditions are um, really bad for fertility management. So what happens, growers usually fertilize in, uh, they'll fertilize in the fall. They'll make a bet. They'll try to fertilize in the fall. They'll hope that snows comes down and it uh, sort of glues the nitrogen into the ground. And then they have enough nitrogen to start the season. But if it's wet, if it's warm, <coughs> then that does not happen. What happened is the nitrogen leaches out, you know, down, down, down to the bottom of the field into a place that sometimes even the roots can't actually get to it. And so it's kind of a futile fertility management idea to, to even try doing it in the fall in these kind of conditions. But they didn't know it, and so they fertilized it. And so our systems were able to um, kind of, uh, on the right, what you're seeing is the yield risk projected, which is projecting that there, there's a high risk of, if you don't fertilize again, there's a high risk of losing yield because of it. And that's what happened last year. It was an abnormally wet and warm year. So these are the kind of insights we can produce uh, for our growers, and we are producing these kind of things. Um, so the bottom line is there's a lot of data. Um, not all of it is big, but it's very interesting. It's heterogeneous. There's a lot of problems we need to solve. Um, 
it will require a lot of efforts from cross teams. Um, so I challenge everyone on that side. Um, and I hope I got you a little bit, tiny little bit excited about this world of agriculture. That's it. All right. Sivan, thanks. Thanks so much. So we have about 10 minutes for questions before we move on to the, the next slot. I see them miking up there. Uh, I've got a question right at the back. Yep. Uh, hello. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I had a quick question that was in a similar vein to the one that was asked of Castlate of how do you end up aligning the best interests of the farmer in terms of how they can optimize their results according to the data science and the interests of your parent company? Um, we actually signed an agreement two years ago called the Open Data Initiative, the Ag Open uh, Data Initiative. Uh, we are true believers in opening the data, making it transparent, and as a result, we gain a lot of trust from our customers. We also give them the opportunity to decide what data they will share with us and what data they will not want to share with anyone else. And in, I think we enhance that trust by doing that. And so they have complete control over their data. They have complete control whether we get to use it for data science or we can share it with our parent company or not. And we have been very, very, very open about that. And I'm hoping, um, and I believe that that's how we're gaining kind of the trust. And the insights we provide are parent company agnostic. Okay. Yes. Uh, let's take a question right on the side there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I guess you talked a little bit about this with uh, the different areas of um, where over different years they could be good or bad, but I was wondering how you factor in uh, long-term sustainability and if you have um, maybe models based on permaculture or non-traditional, or I guess those are traditional, you know, unorthodox or orthodox, <laughs> just all sorts of different farming methods. Um, that are that more are, sustainable? Yeah. Yeah, I think that we, Part of the challenge, I think, in these kind of topics of longer term decisions is that you really need to monitor practices over time. And that, I think, is the biggest challenge in agriculture, um, probably in other worlds as well. But you really do need to monitor the data over time in order to be able to make recommendation of longer term. Like, for example, there's a lot, um, there's a lot of, um, I do this because my father did this. A lot of it in agriculture. A lot of it is like, my grandpa used to plant on April 1st, so I am planting on April 1st. And you're like, well, maybe this year April 1st is not the best for you. And so there's a lot of mind shifting that needs to happen. I am kind of a believer that through data you will be able to make that kind of mind shift. Um, I think what would happen is right now the data with the data that we are getting through our platform, which I think was a real strategic investment in climate, which comes back to like the point of making growers trust us, give us the data so we can actually help them make better decisions. But it's true that right now I think that no, you know, we have to accumulate data in agriculture to get to a point where we can make like, you know, you should, you should for the next five years do crop rotations of this type because then it will benefit for you for, for the future. So those kind of decisions I think are much harder at this point to do. Okay, there's a question right here. Yes, uh, can we move it down a couple of rows here first? Yeah. Hi, thank you for your presentation. So I, I've got two questions basically. One is, are you very focused on US or helping farmers around the globe, including countries like India, where the rate of per acre outcome is much lower than in the US. So there's a lot that countries can gain and farmers can gain. The second is, what, what's your business model? Uh, does the farmer directly subscribe to this? Sorry? What's the business model? Does the farmer subscribe or do you s give access to some kind of a conglomeration who then oh, yeah. distributes okay. it to the farmer in terms of access? So your first question is yes. We work with other countries. We're working in Brazil, we work with Canada, and we have an initiative in India for that exact small, holder, small farm holders for that exact reason because their decision making is very different. Um, the type of decision that they can make is different. 
Um, and so we are, um, we do have, you know, uh, models and data that supports those kind of decisions. Um, so we're expanding in that direction, which is a good direction. Um, uh, the other question about the business model, we, um, we have three different uh, tiers of our product. We have a completely free version. At the free version, um, Climate Prime, it is just uh, kind of a weather app. You, you, you get to see the weather on your field. You can tap and look at the very detailed information for your uh, farm. But um, then we have a, a pro and a plus version. The plus version is, uh, is this idea that we, um, we, growers have a lot of data, but just like everyone else in the world, um, they sort of have uh, been accumulating it from different sensors for different companies, and so there wasn't like a nice platform that everyone, you know, just bring all your data here, because here you'll be able to see all of it. Uh, part of the open, open uh, data initiative is to help that, is to help other companies adopt certain best practices in uh, engineering so that we don't disable the grower, right? We enable them to see the data. We don't tell them, oh, you're locked to this company for the next t 20 years because, well, this format, this, this format of data doesn't going, is not going to be working in my platform. So um, we are at the, at the second tier, we are letting them bring all their data and they can look at and gain insights into the data. We're helping them summarize it, looking at different aspects of it. And at the pro level, we add, add these kind of um, advisors, which they don't have access unless they go into that pro version. Uh, we work directly with growers. Our customers are one-to-one -one growers. They're not. Um, we also work with dealers, which is a is a very um, it's it's very U.S. this part. But they a lot of growers work with their dealers to sort of manage their like decisions of buying, and so we work with dealers as well. But our main customer is the grower. Great. Let's take got time for a couple more. So this one there, and then we'll come back to you there. Yeah, the gentleman there. Thank you. Hi, so I was wondering if you could share some advice for um, communicating complex machine learning models <coughs> to people who don't have the technical uh, skill to interpret that so that it's not a black box because that's definitely the, the thing that resonated with me the most because machine learning can make an impact in so many different places where the end user shouldn't have to interpret it as a black box, basically. Right, right. So, um, I'm Bayesian. It's a moment of sharing for a minute. <laughs> I, am, I am Bayesian. I believe in taking, uh, in making systems that interact with people, um, that let them learn through their experience and uh, incorporating prior information into the system in order to make the system learn through not just data but also true experts' opinions. And I think by taking that approach, we have been much more successful. Um, we also, I think in our product, we, um, like the nitrogen advisor, for example, the one that sort of shows the nitrogen over time, we allow um, growers to play around with the model so they can bring in different decisions, try different things, and see how it affects the model. And it has to align with their mental model. That's the essence of it. It has to align, like if they do some, if they change the target yield, if the fertility doesn't change, something is awfully wrong. So you have to understand the mental model and how people make their decisions in order to build a model to support that. And I believe that we're not gonna, ch you know, I, I'm less of like a pessimist of like the world is gonna end because of machine learning. I'm more like the, uh, the world is gonna be, be better because of machine learning. And so we have to work with the people like perception and help them through their perception to, to teach them more and more. Just like the system needs to learn, they need to learn. The other aspect is um, going to experts. And agriculture has really worked for us. Um, going to domain experts in, in, in academia, in industry and um, showing them how our model works and be, having them be advocates for us. Um, and that seemed to work very well, right? So in, in, in medicine, that would go, go to the doctors, go to the pharmacists, and show them how the system recommends. And usually if it works well with their mental model of how they've been doing it, it's good. And if it doesn't, it kind of, they don't like it. But over time, I'm hoping they will adjust. That's kind of a, that's a, that's a very hard thing to adjust for. But I think if you take a Bayesian approach, you talk about this is, this is 
experts and I should listen to them. They know something. They may be biased. Incorporate the bias into your model, right? That's how we use it. So that's kind of my two cents on it. Thank you. Okay, let's take a final question here, yeah, gentleman in the blue. Uh, thank you. My, my first job as a teenager in Central Ohio was um, bailing hay. So I work with a lot of farmers, <laughs> and uh, these are multi-generational farmers. And I, I learned a few biases. One is I didn't trust city slickers. And, 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 and they wouldn't trust a 25-year-old coming from the university telling them how to grow anything, especially since they've been doing it for 100 years. So I'm really curious about how you make inroads with farmers because they would seem, it seems to me, they would probably not value a lot of the science. I, I guess that's my question. Yeah, so you know, I, I actually don't think farmers are much different than um, other people in that sense, right? Um, you know, if you've ever seen kind of a data science or analytical competency over time, how people develop it, they go from, you know, describing to diagnose, like how, the, how analytic grows, right? It's going from, first you describe the data, then you diagnose things that are wrong, maybe in the, through models, then you start to do forecasting, you're trying to predict things, then you start to pres prescribe things. I think we think of our funnel of three tiers of, of um, of products that way. Our first, mo our first product is very descriptive. It's just like, look, this is what the weather is, right? Uh, by the way, there's also, like, you think that that part is easy, but, but it's not. <laughs> because you know, they have a little, like, for example, weather. Weather is an interesting concept. You look at those radar, if you ever look at forecasts or how, many, how much rain it rained in the last 24 hours, I dare you to take a, a gauge, put it in your garden, and see if those things match. And I, I bet you whatever amount of money you want, they will not. And so even in the, descri in the describe is in a kind of a hard thing. But you first teach them to describe data. You have to teach them a little bit of analytics, right? Then you teach them to um, diagnose. And so our second tier is all about diagnosing. For, exam for example, we show them relationship between their yield, their particular hybrid with uh, the soil type. You just show them like very simple two by two examples, right? Um, just like you teach in one, stat 101, like people, you teach people how to learn the data. Um, and so that's the second tier. The third tier is where we blow their minds, right? And we're like, <laughs> okay, we can prescribe things to the future. And that is a very hard hurdle to go through, right? That, that is not an easy kind of like, trust me, I'm a data scientist. I can't even grow a tomato in my plant, but I can tell you what to do, right? That, that's a hard like moment for them. Um, so I think you do it two, three ways, two ways. One is what we discussed before, which is you go to the experts, you build models that are able to not be complete black boxes so people can understand them. That's A. Your recommendation systems cannot be black boxes. They have to explain things. Uh, but the other side is you produce products that teaches, teach them over time the different aspects of data science. And I think that's kind of how we've been thinking about it. Great. Cool. Sivan, thank you so much.